The film A Bridge Too Far was released in 1977, and shortly after, a critic named Roger Ebert reviewed the film and said this about it. The movie's big and expensive and filled with stars, but it's not an epic. It's the longest B-grade war movie ever made. Throughout this video, I will share why I disagree with his statement and consider this movie to truly be an epic. Now, there's no official definition on what makes an epic, so everybody's will change, but here's how I would classify an epic. 1. Budget. A large budget that is reflected onto the screen, creating large-scale scenes and stakes, as well as reflecting in the size and talent in the cast. 2. Runtime. Epics tend to have longer runtimes because of the scale of the movie, and the stories tend to have more depth than your average 90-minute movie. 3. Theme. Epics take themselves seriously as movies. Jokes are limited to just being in realistic dialogue and will feel more real than your classic action adventure or romantic comedy. Under these rules, I would claim that the World War II movie, A Bridge Too Far, is indeed an epic scale movie. But it tends to be overlooked in film history, and it's not a well-known movie among younger audience like your other classic epics would be. I will go into reasons to why that is, but first, let's go over the plot. A Bridge Too Far is a movie set after D-Day in World War II. It follows the plan of the Allies to bust through the German lines by dropping paratroopers far behind enemy lines to capture bridges. We're going to fly 35,000 men 300 miles and drop them behind enemy lines. It'll be the largest airborne operation ever mounted. While the main army with the tank division would follow through and link up with the paratroopers, thus crossing the Rhine River, which was pretty much the only thing preventing the end of the war at that point in time. The words come through. I don't know. I followed the military strategy. Now, as the movie progresses, you realize that the strategy that looked really good on paper does not execute very well once carried out. In fact, it plays out more of a disaster for the Allied troops, especially the British troops at the last bridge, Arnheim. So, the movie could be summarized as an account of the failed mission. This movie is based off a book with the same title, but don't let that mislead you because the book is a historical account of the mission with the codename Market Garden, and the movie adapts how the book decides to tell the story. In fact, a lot of the dialogue of the movie comes from the book, which came from the interviews that the author conducted. The author of the book is historian Cornelius Ryan, who wrote a total of three World War II books, one of which is very recognizable because it was also adapted into a movie, and that was the D-Day movie, The Longest Day. So out of three books, two of them were made into movies. So this author has a pretty good success rate with these World War II books he specialized in. As I mentioned, the books are very accurate to the actual events of this mission, and the movie surprisingly sticks close to the book. So in turn, we arrive with a very historically accurate movie. If you want more information from the historical side, the History Buffs YouTube channel makes a good video, and I would agree with their assessment that this is one of, if not the most historically accurate war movies created. Now that I got that out of the way, I will try to refrain from saying that every five seconds and just focus on this film as a movie and not a historical work. From the very beginning of production of this film, they wanted this movie to be a blockbuster. They loaded up the film with a giant cast of some huge names from the era. Just look at the size of this featured cast list. They of course had to pay for all those actors, which led to this film having the biggest budget ever seen in a movie at the time of its release with a budget of $27 million. A Bridge Too Far would not hold that reward too long though with Superman coming out the next year that would have a budget of about twice its size. The movie was released in the summer of 1977, which means it didn't have the box office to itself. Most notably, Star Wars was released just a month before and owned the box office for quite a while. But also Smokey and the Bandit and the James Bond The Spy Who Loved Me coming out within a month also popping up with big box office numbers for the year. A Bridge Too Far ended up fifth in the worldwide box office with $50 million, which is by no means a disappointment, but with the budget I'm sure the studio wanted to see probably double what it made. The reception of the movie was only slightly positive at best, and to this day not much has changed on that front. And once again, I will give my thoughts on that in a bit, but let's continue with the stats. The film is directed by Richard Attenborough, who is indeed the older brother of Sir David Attenborough, who you have heard on every great nature documentary. Richard Attenborough did direct other films and documentaries, but he also acted in a lot of movies, including The Great Escape and the Jurassic Park franchise. The writer was William Goldman, who did other popular movies like The Princess Bride and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and of course, the author of the book was the original writer credited. The composer was John Addison, who won that year's Best Film Music Award for the year, and it was definitely deserved. It uses a big band theme that was typical for these World War II movies, except this theme had more of a grand feeling toward it, and the theme is edited to fit some of the sadder parts of the movie, and it adapts well. There are also other times where the score complements the film perfectly by adding anxiety or tension to whatever the scene is asking for. 
Now, let's go over the cast, which might take a minute. To get through this long list, I'll go through the sequential order of where the actor plays their role. The first notable actor in this movie is Dirk Bogard, playing Lieutenant General Browning. And this was a difficult role to play because Browning is almost set up to be the villain of the story because he has to be the voice of the General Montgomery and carry out the orders he has been given. Bogard does a great job as playing a smug type of character, but at the same time, he gives good justification for the actions he is taking. There have been thousands of photographs from this sortie and from all the others. How many of them have shown tax? Just these, sir. And you seriously consider asking us to cancel the biggest operation mounted since D-Day? Dirk Bogard was a World War II veteran that was actually active on Montgomery's intelligence team during this stage of the war. So Bogard actually knew the real Browning during the war, and I'm sure that affected how he played the character. The next group of actors are a part of the armor division, which was framed as the cavalry in the film. Edward Fox played Lieutenant General Horrocks and won Best Actor in a Supporting Role for his portrayal. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And you can see why. He did a great job bringing energy and positivity to the movie when it was starting to get a little slow. Gentlemen, this is a story that you will tell your grandchildren and mightily bored they'll be. Next is Michael Caine as Lieutenant Colonel Joe Vandular, who was the field leader for the tank division. He did a great job being able to convey his emotions and attitudes with little words. During the action scenes, you can see him talking but not hear anything, when you definitely get the point of what he's trying to convey. Michael was a big name to have on this movie with his popularity from Get Carter and other war movies like Battle of Britain and The Eagle Has Landed, and he owns every second he's on screen. It would be bad form to arrive in advance of schedule. In the nick of time, we'd do nicely. The next group is the 101st Airborne Division, who are in charge of capturing the first bridge. Elliot Gold would play Colonel Robert Stout, and he had a fun character to play. He was 100% serious in his scenes, but was also the most humorous character in the movie. He did a great job setting the stakes of the mission. Right! Let's haul a little ass! Go! Also in this group was James Kane, who almost made the film rated R due to his use of the F word, but it ended up with a PG rating. James Kane didn't have any interaction with the other large cast and felt like he was almost a part of a separate movie, but he didn't need any help carrying his scenes because he did just fine on his own and brought an exciting side story to the movie. You wouldn't really have killed me, would you? Next, we have the 82nd Division, who was in charge of capturing the bridge at Nijmegen. Now, I think this group had the hardest job on the acting front because they were given very little time and the audience doesn't even see the bridge till the end. So, Ryan O'Neill, who had just come off a big role in Barry Lyndon, played Brigadier General James Gavin, and he had to convey the importance of his scenes through dialogue in random buildings or forests, and he did a fine job showing the frustrations he had with the plan in general and trying not to be the one to rock the boat. How have you been? We're some best friends at Nemex. Look, this is why we can't take the bridge. The Germans have moved in SS Panzer troops. You'd think they didn't want us to get across or something. The other big name in this section, of course, was Robert Redford as Major Julian Cook. He was just as big of a name then as he is now with Jeremiah Johnson, All the President's Men, and Butch Cassidy coming out before this. So it's a fun surprise when he pops up near the end of the movie to carry the large final action scene. Needless to say, he does great. Plus one more thing. He's got to be dumb enough to do it. Start getting ready. Then there is the 1st British Airborne Division at Arnheim. The two big names here are Sean Connery as Major General Roy Yurkart and Anthony Hopkins as Colonel Frost. And I'm sure it surprised the studio when someone proposed that Hopkins would be the one in the middle of the action. Take cover! Bring up the pit! And Connery would be the one stuck in the attic. Surrounded, sir. Yes, quite. Connery was obviously a huge name at this time, and Hopkins was just beginning to make a name for himself, which this movie would probably help boost him to where he is at today, and he is still making movies to this day. But both played their parts perfectly. Connery just needs to talk in his normal voice to show the perfect amount of concern, 
and Hopkins nailed the role of the beleaguered general in charge of the tired soldiers. Another actor who does surprisingly well is Christopher Good, who did a great job playing next to Anthony Hopkins in what was really a startup role for him. And he probably gets my favorite line in the movie. We haven't the proper facilities to take you all prisoner. Sorry. Also in the Polish division was Gene Hackman as Major General Sosabowski, and he was there to be the skeptic, and he had a great line dropping to almost certain doom. God bless Field Marshal Montgomery. Another big name was Laurence Olivier as a Dutch civilian doctor who would make a plea for the one hour truce and his acting did a good job conveying the cost of war. Alongside him was Liv Ullman as Kate, a Dutch homeowner who converted her home to a hospital. Liv got the fun task of being pretty much the only girl in the entire movie and she did fine showing compassion to the dying soldiers at Arnheim. He shall cover thee with his feathers. And under his wing shall thou trust, his truth shall be thy shield. And wow, that is a huge cast. So we can finally move on to the next section, which is the cinematography of this film. And it is insanely good. There are so many frames you can screenshot to show the massive scale of this movie. It does a great job of showing the hundreds of extras they would have needed to pull off some of these scenes. The world feels very fleshed and open. There's hardly any scenes that look like they were filmed on a set. Overall, it looks like you're actually there in 1944. In Arnheim, they do a great job of showing the slow destruction of the city. Also, showing the bridges in perspective makes the mission seem justified with how big they are. You can just see why they were so important. There's also one scene where they were just showing off with the absolute massive scale of this movie. And that was the extended paratrooper sequence showing the soldiers loading up, taking off, and then the entire drop scene. It honestly looks like it could be from a documentary and puts many modern movies to shame. Next is the action, which is top notch from start to finish. The movie starts off a little slow, but when the artillery starts its creeping advancement, you know that things are going to get good. The action has a lot of wide shots and doesn't ever get too choppy. The best part is how it shows the power scale of 1940s war machines. You feel how helpless the paratroopers are when a tank crosses the bridge. It shows how effective a pillbox is to a whole advancing squad. It also shows the importance of airplanes in ground fights. There is also the boat crossing scene where you feel every second of how long it takes to cross the river. Stay down. Not one action scene is a waste in this movie and it's another place you feel the massive budget. Another part of the movie that I never see get enough credit is the dialogue. As I mentioned earlier, a bit of it comes from the book, but it's all very quippy and lighthearted despite the heaviness of the situation they are in. It makes for a very interesting and memorable mix. It's one of those movies where you want to watch with subtitles because you don't want to miss anything they are saying. When you refer to Bailey crap, I take it you mean that glorious precision made British built bridge which is the envy of the civilized world. Yeah. Now, if you have never watched the movie and are just looking at this video essay here, you would probably be wondering why this movie doesn't have perfect reviews and is not considered a historical epic by the masses. The reviews for this movie are just above average, but there is a few reasons that I can see why it is not widely regarded as a masterpiece. And that reason is that it sacrifices classic cinematic ideas for being historically accurate. For one, there is no character development in the whole movie. The movie is the telling of a story of the battle, and the focus is not on having a deep personal character arc. On top of this, the story moves so fast, you don't spend a lot of time with any one actor. So that means if you are not interested in the battle and the story there, then it's hard to connect with the movie. The second thing is that it does not follow a typical story structure. The first five minutes are a literal documentary to set the stage for the point of war we are at. The next 30 minutes are military strategy debates, so it has a slow start. Then, almost the next two hours are non-stop action and intense scenes, ending with a big budget action scene. This is where most movies would end, but since there is more historical story to tell, the movie continues for another 30 minutes showing the brutal realities of a failed plan. 
Third, it takes random interviews from the story and converts them into the movie, but a lot of them feel tacked on, like the whole James Cain sequence, where you could totally eliminate all his scenes from the movie and you wouldn't lose any part of the storyline. It's just a good story that was in the book, so they added it to the movie, despite it not having any connection. Now, if you are into history or big cinematic war movies, this is quite literally the perfect movie for you. However, if you are not a part of that niche audience, you will feel like this is a type of a documentary that you had to get through in history class. Now, I gave my criteria for an epic at the beginning of this video, so let's go back over it. One, budget. This movie has a huge budget and they utilized it very well, creating a large scale and using great actors. Two, runtime. The movie is just shy of three hours. Three, theme. The movie conveys a deep theme about the failure of generals and never undercuts its tone for a cheap joke or wink at the camera, so I would definitely consider this an epic scale movie. Now, I have read the book twice and watched this movie at least six times, and I enjoy it better every time I watch it, and it would easily be placed in my top three films of all time. I highly recommend this film and give it a 10 out of 10. If you have seen the movie, would you also consider it an epic? Let me know, and thanks for watching. Splendid view of the Dutch countryside. Can't see any tanks.